Welcome to everybody to today's webinar, which is part of our annual policy conference. Uh, this is um, hosted by the European Coalition for Israel, uh, as we have done for the last uh, 17 years, actually. Um, today, um, we will focus on the changing dynamics in the Middle East over the last four years and um, also look at the coming four years as it relates to transatlantic cooperation in the Middle East and especially in relation to Israel. Please allow me to introduce our panelists. And I see that the last panelist just arrived uh, a few seconds ago. We are especially happy to, to see you, uh, Lucas Mandel. Um, starting um, in my introduction here with uh, Fernando Gentilini, who is the um, managing director of uh, the Middle East and North Africa uh, section at the European External Action Service. Uh, we don't see you, Fernando, at the moment, but uh, we, did, we did see you just a few moments ago, so I, I hope that uh, um, the technology will work also. Yes, there you are. I'm very, here. Very good and very much welcome. I also say a warm welcome to our um, long-standing friend, uh, Ronnie Leshnoyar, permanent representative of Israel to the EU, whom we had the pleasure of um, conversing with in July when we had a similar webinar. And uh, last but not least, uh, from Vienna, if I'm not mistaken, Lu Lukas uh, Mandel, a member of European Parliament and also chair of uh, Transatlantic Friends of uh, Israel, or very much welcome. Let me also say, as for procedures, we expect to go on for 45 to 55 minutes. Mr. Gentilini will have to leave us in 45 minutes. So if you see him leave, it's not something we have said. So, um, uh, but we are very grateful for the time that you can give us today. Let me just say in, uh, in a few uh, sentences that this is a very different Middle East than what we had four years ago um, when there was a change of government in Washington. And, and perhaps this is a little bit uh, um, belittling of, of the European Union that we follow, or at least today that we are relating now to what is happening in in Washington and looking at this as a potential new cycle of, of developments. Uh, there is, as we all know, uh, currently an unprecedented uh, rapprochement between Israel and many of her former enemies. Whereas Iran continues to pose a clear and present danger, perhaps even an existential threat to Israel and to the wider region. The gradual withdrawal of the US from the Middle East begun under the current administration. And uh, we can expect the new US administration to further downgrade its commitments to the Middle East. What does this mean for the region and what does it mean for Europe? Part of this new dynamic is also that the region seems to understand these changing priorities and is organizing itself in what some call a security corridor, stretching from, depending how you want to define it, from Greece to India, including countries such as Cyprus, Egypt, Sudan, Jordan, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, perhaps even India. And with the current tension between Turkey and France, one could perhaps even add France to that constellation. At the same time, we have um, a European Union that is fractured and will soon be without one of its nuclear powers and a UN Security Council member, namely the United Kingdom. As European Coalition for Israel, let, let me do the messaging right from the very beginning with two sentences. Uh, we wish that the EU, together with the next US administration, would build on the current momentum of peace building in the Middle East, uh, while at the same time remaining steadfast in our opposition to any state or military group that calls for the destruction of another UN member state, in this case, for the destruction of the Jewish state. With this opening remark, can I please ask each one of you 
to give an introductory remark of uh, no more than five minutes, commenting on the prospects for Israel and the Middle East for the next four years, as well as the prospects for closer transatlantic cooperation in relation to the Middle East. Maybe before I give the floor to the first panelist, I, I need to add a disclaimer. We have American friends also listening in. And so I want to be careful how I relate to, uh, to a new administration, which will be finally decided on the 14th of uh, December. But uh, with this disclaimer and with this introduction, perhaps we can start with um, Fernando uh, Gentilini, please. Thank you very much. And thanks a lot for, for inviting me in, uh, in this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, I remember we met uh, some times ago in, in the European Parliament. Uh, it was a different time. Uh, now we, we are organized in, in this way. But uh, many thanks. Uh, I, I am, I'm very glad to, to be here. Uh, look, I, I think I can be really very brief. Uh, in this initial uh, introductory remark, because, uh, by the way, I am an official of the EU, so I don't have uh, certain luxuries uh, like, uh, you know, think tank or to speculate uh, on, on what the future is going to be. What I would like to do, I think, is in, in three, four brief points to, to give a, a, a quick uh, overview on, on where we are. Uh, on, on the issues that you, 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 you mentioned, Mr. Chairman. The first thing I want to say is that the European Union and Israel uh, have, a, have a very special relationship. Uh, this relationship is unique for historical, political, cultural uh, reasons. And uh, actually, we, we have been working uh, hard uh, during these past years to, 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 to move on with this relationship. We entertain uh, uh, an extensive uh, economic, social, financial, scientific, technological, and cultural cooperation. And this is uh, moving on. Uh, even in the last weeks, despite uh, the pandemic and all now these uh, logistic difficulties, we have been having uh, various meetings, uh, subcommittees, uh, engaging uh, ministries from Israel and DGs from uh, the commission. So I, I just want to say, actually, I want to say that the public should know more, should know more about this, because I think there are a lot of good stories to tell. So this, when it comes to our uh, bilateral relation, which, which is, is, is intense and, and, and very, very, very fruitful and very good technical level. Uh, second point, because you mentioned the region, of course, I think the, the good news in the last month uh, has been this uh, normalization process, which uh, takes shape. Uh, we have uh, welcomed uh, publicly in all forms uh, the Abraham Accords, uh, uh, because uh, uh, it's a good development in, in a region which is more used to other kind of news than this one. So uh, we were very, very positive. And as I said, uh, we publicly welcome this because uh, first uh, Habram Accord, we, we believe can help establish a new formal relations between countries, uh, countries which have decided, of course, to put their differences aside and to focus on cooperation and to engage in cooperation. So that's good. Uh, also, second reasons why we are positive and welcoming this agreement is because uh, this uh, uh, potentially can enhance uh, relations in the region in areas which are key, uh, technology, research, energy, regional cooperation. So all that goes in the direction of regional cooperation is, is very good, I think, uh, for, for everybody. And, uh, and also uh, another reason, uh, because uh, we, we, we wanted to welcome the Abraham Accord is because we, we, we believe this could have positive effect on other countries, other situations, uh, and, and in, the, in the region as a, as a whole. Uh, now, uh, let me, let me uh, come a little bit 
to the uh, Middle East peace process because this is another issue which for us is, is, very, is very important and in which uh, talking about the UN Israel we have important and fundamental differences. Um, uh, we continue to, to support a two-state solution uh, based on 67 lines uh, with Jerusalem as a shared capital. Uh, we actually continue to, 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 to speak out when we see things which do not go in that direction, uh, announce of settlements uh, and uh, demolitions and all this kind of, uh, of development. And this is the position of the 27 member states and the positions that we express in all uh, contacts that we have, both with Israelis and uh, with, the, with the Palestinians. Um, actually, uh, we are also uh, uh, told uh, and, and instructed by our Council of Ministers that uh, in order to have further development in our bilateral relations with Israel, we need to see some progress when it comes to the Middle East peace process. Uh, of course, it is also clear that our relations cannot be viewed only through the prism of the Middle East peace process, but I think this is an important element to, to, to take into account. Uh, we are in, in constant uh, contact with the uh, with Israeli uh, government, uh, the HRBP, the High Representative, Joseph Borrell, is in touch with the Foreign Minister Ashkenazi. They met over the summer. Since then, we are regular contact. They both want to enhance bilateral relations and seek ways to jointly work uh, uh, on improving the, 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 the regional security. I also want to say that, you know, our aim, uh, we want to bring, let's say, the, the political dimension of the European Union and Israel relations in line with the reality of our economic and people-to-people -people relations. I think this is how, how we want to to, 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 to move on. But I mentioned uh, uh, some of the issues which are relevant to this. And the fourth point I want to make to conclude is that precisely in order to strengthen our uh, relation, we are looking at way to hold uh, the Association Council between the European Union and Israel. Uh, you know, Mr. Chair and others in the group might know that this uh, is our main uh, format for, for, for political cooperation. Uh, he has not met uh, in the last eight years uh, because of what I just said before, but I think uh, is something we are looking at and uh, if conditions allow and if our member states agree, uh, we would like to hold this as soon as possible. So, uh, I, I was a bit dry and a bit, uh, you know, not very speculative uh, 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 on, the, on the future. Obviously, obviously, as you said, we want to cooperate with the international community and with our partners in the international community. So this is where the U.S. Uh, comes in, into, into, into the picture, of course, and the more we can cooperate in the region, uh, the better. I think that's, that has always been the case. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando, if I may call you by your first please, name. Please, please. Uh, because I know this, this goes down very well with our Israeli friends. They always look at you with suspicion when you call them with a formal title. So I'm, I'm not sure, Ambassador Lechnoyar, or, or, or if I may say Ronnie, but I think this is, this is your turn to um, uh, reflect on what was just said, please. Thank you, thank you very much and good afternoon to you all from Brussels. Um, I, I, I will start by uh, uh, thanking you, Thomas, and the ECI for many years of uh, friendship and uh, support for the state of uh, Israel. We have been working, working together for many years on, uh, on, on different issues and topics, uh, starting from uh, many United Nations uh, and related issues, and now uh, European Union uh, uh, challenges. And I know that you are always for us uh, when we need you, and I thank you for that. And I'm also happy to share this uh, 
panel with uh, two good friends, uh, uh, MEP uh, uh, Lucas Mandel and uh, uh, managing director Fernando Gentilini, uh, whom I know both very well. I know how dedicated they are to, uh, to Israel and how good friends they are for me. Thank you very much for, uh, for that. I'll be brief in my opening uh, uh, remarks. Uh, we are looking, uh, uh, I, I have to say, it's very exciting uh, um, when you look at, uh, at things from the Israeli uh, uh, point of view, uh, what is happening in, uh, in the United States, the change of administrations, uh, the second uh, arena that we are following closely is the situation in uh, the Arab world, of course. And uh, uh, the third one is uh, Israel's domestic politics, which I will not expand on, but uh, as always are very exciting, noisy, sometimes messy, but always uh, interesting. And if I uh, combine all that with my responsibility as ambassador to the European Union and to NATO, then uh, uh, all three uh, um, uh, theaters, the US, Arab world, and Israel are relevant to what I'm doing here in, uh, in, uh, in Brussels. And I will uh, say, uh, uh, just as a food for thought, that uh, I believe that we live in an era of transition uh, that will be better viewed from an historical perspective. But we are in that uh, uh, period. So on the one hand, it's transition of leadership from the giants of uh, the uh, generation of leaders that uh, uh, fought and, uh, and, and won a Second World uh, uh, War. Uh, the last of them, I believe, or one of the last was Shimon Peres, uh, who passed away uh, four years ago. And now we, had, we have a younger uh, generation of uh, leadership, younger style, uh, a different uh, 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 vision. And this change is very significant for what uh, uh, we are discussing today. The second uh, uh, element of transition is technology. We moved from the uh, 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 age of uh, um, manual uh, 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 technology uh, uh, to digital technology. And, uh, and that change uh, is having an impact on our daily life, but also on politics and also on uh, current events in the, in the Middle East, in Europe, in America, and elsewhere. And the third thing is that we have new challenges uh, globally and, uh, and regionally that we have to, to address. And those challenges has uh, also uh, not only social and economic uh, impact, but also uh, political uh, uh, impact. Uh, climate change, uh, drought, uh, floods, uh, uh, deforestation has also a political uh, impact on population and, uh, and regimes uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere. Uh, indirectly, indirectly, they also influence what is happening in Europe, immigration, uh, etc. And we have to address those challenges uh, uh, as well. But all in all, it's, 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 it's exciting. Uh, it creates, of course, uh, um, many challenges, but also opens up many opportunities. And uh, perhaps we will discuss uh, uh, several of them later in our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Leshno Yar. And um, we will go to our third um, uh, panelist in uh, Vienna at the moment. We will go from Sandel to Mandel. Um, you, you, you're miss, missing an E between the D and L, but, but otherwise there is a resemblance. It's very good to have you on the panel, and we, we know that you um, have a particular perspective uh, being the chair of Transatlantic Friends of, uh, of Israel, so we are very keen to hear your uh, thoughts and, and your introductory remark, please. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for having me. It's a privilege uh, to having the opportunity to be part of this distinguished panel today. Uh, there's a lot to discuss because both is true. As you have said, Mr. Sandel, that uh, we have a momentum now. And uh, after major achievements uh, in the last years, uh, 
uh, there can be achieved a lot in the years ahead if we act accordingly. And at the same time, it's true, I guess, what the Honorable Ambassador has said that we live in times of transition. And both is important for uh, the future relationship uh, between EU and Israel, uh, for the transatlantic relationship concerning Israel uh, and general for, I would say, the mutual relationships in the Western world. That's uh, the way I want to put it. Uh, and uh, I'm also grateful to Mr. Gentilini for pointing out, let's say, very analytically uh, the whole situation. And uh, I would say as a parliamentarian compared to him, I feel the obligation to figure out what's possible and uh, to uh, maybe to uh, try to play a role in a positive development. What would that mean uh, for the future? Uh, as far as we can see, uh, Israel remains the only democratic state based on rule of law in the Middle East. So there's a natural uh, relation a natural partnership between EU and Israel. And we should never forget, we must never forget to point that out and to underline that. And also to remind some in Europe on that. Uh, so there's a natural relationship uh, based on values, based on our approach to uh, society, democracy, uh, and, uh, and other values, uh, but also based on interest. Uh, of course, in terms of security, this is this is something we also have to underline again and again that Israel is a, an important security provider, not only for itself, not only for the Middle East, uh, but also for Northern Africa or Europe generally. One can say for the world, actually, compared to its size, Israel is a, a huge security provider, uh, but also when it comes to uh, our pure European interest in uh, terms of economy in terms of education, in terms of science and innovation. And that's the field, uh, uh, what I meant when I remembered what the ambassador has said regarding uh, times of transition. Uh, what we can achieve in partnerships with uh, a country with, for example, the largest number of startup companies per capita, which is also Israel. What we can achieve via innovation and academia uh, relations and partnerships between Europe, the EU, but also other European countries, frankly speaking, when I think about Switzerland, for example, but also the UK in the future, uh, and Israel is a lot. And what we achieve economically also always means something for our values. So here the circle is closed, and that means that we have to use this momentum. And Europe has to do its homework. I'm very clear on that. Uh, not everything was wrong Europe has done regarding uh, Middle East policies in the last years, but by far not everything was right. And, uh, and a lot was missing, actually. Uh, and that's why I appreciate that uh, Commissioner Vahili has uh, already a few months ago announced that uh, the Association uh, Council with uh, Israel should reconvene and there should be a new association agreement uh, because the council has not re, uh, has not convened for many many years, and the uh, uh, association agreement is extremely outdated. And uh, this is part of the homework uh, Europe has to do. And I would also call it uh, one of the achievements of our actually uh, multi-partisan group of transatlantic friends of Israel in European Parliament, but also uh, uh, let's say a good approach from, from the Commissioner himself. But we had pushed for that for for a very, very long time. And I'm happy to make steps forward here. I'm also happy that the Abraham Accords are praised by uh, the former US administration, the new US administration, many, many reasonable uh, voices in Europe. I would say the majority of voices in Europe and uh, things can be achieved. I can be frank uh, on uh, the nuclear deal with Iran, where Europe always uh, had the position that it may be more secure to keep Iran into that deal rather more than to uh, skip uh, the deal. And obviously the new US administration has a similar position on that and maybe we can achieve a lot uh, on that level. And there are many other fields where uh, I'm optimistic. I don't want to be naive. Uh, there will be obstacles again uh, and there will be security threats, especially regarding 
the civilians in Israel, but uh, to all of us. Uh, there will be discussion about terrorism, and uh, terrorism is a field where some in Europe still tend to remain naive. Uh, um, there will be discussions about banning Hezbollah in, in its entirety, which will be important, uh, and maybe also about Hamas. But generally, there is a, a good reason for, for being optimistic and, uh, and therefore to work hard uh, on, on the coming up opportunities. Thank you, uh, Lucas Mandel, for your words uh, of, of encouragement and, and positive words. Um, as I mentioned um, at the very beginning, uh, Mr. Gentilini will, will have to, to leave uh, in, in some 15 minutes. So we will go over to Gentilini and um, I will combine what I had um, initially planned to be two different questions. One is uh, perhaps now then looking a little bit more in detail um, at the last four years, and we already heard uh, your very positive comments on what has been achieved. Um, um, but maybe to combine then and say, well, looking at the next four years, what do you see as the major policy changes to be expected and, um, and the possible outcome in the, in the region? If I may be as blunt as, as, and pedagogical as, as to ask a question, as for the, uh, well, the Trump administration, if you would grade from one to five, you, you may also want to think of that. And, and I, will, I will ask the, the, the other panelists the, the same, but if, you, if we come back at looking at the last four years, uh, I remember actually a year ago, I asked this question at our annual conference. At that time, there was nothing uh, uh, public which had been presented uh, at that time, I asked, is there anything in the deal of the century that you consider to be worth, uh, worthwhile for the, for the external action service to, uh, to study more in detail? And I think at that time, you were, you were rather uh, diplomatic not to comment because there was obviously not anything publicly uh, that had been, been published. But today, of course, the last year in particular has been... Uh, historical, would you want to comment on, on, uh, um, on, on the achievements of the last year? What I hear you saying, and I'm very happy to hear that, is that you, you are rather generous also with your praise to the uh, outgoing administration, whereas, of course, policy differences uh, remain. But could you, could you elaborate a little bit more? I don't know if this question is directed to Mr. Gentilini or to me. It is to Gentilini, yes. So okay, let's sorry for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for, for the question. Uh, what I would say is, is that, uh, as I said at the beginning, mentioning the Abraham Accord, uh, I mean, why this is a, a good, a positive development? I think it is good because it shows that uh, agreements are possible. It, it shows that even in, in, in the broad Middle East region, the way to go is the way of negotiating agreements, uh, which means to sign up commitments, engagements, in a situation in which uh, all sides wants a win-win situation and they want to engage in cooperation and they want to sign an agreement. So compared with other uh, situation, I think the Abraham Accord shows that uh, the way to move on is the way to make agreement. And make agreement means not to impose agreement. Make agreement means that you negotiate, that the parties themselves negotiate and they agree what is good for them. I think this is the recipe. I always believe that it's uh, much, much better to operate within agreements than outside agreements. And therefore, that's what I, what I would say. Uh, also, you know, uh, making reference to, to other example of uh, possible agreements you have hinted to. Uh, I think uh, this is why we have we have welcomed the Abraham Accord because uh, it, it's it's quite a, a, a new uh, parameters. 
Uh, these are different agreements than the agreements with Egypt and Jordan, because those agreements were peace agreements, those agreements were concerning also land. It, it was a different kind of thing, but still uh, uh, they are uh, 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 following that line. Uh, and, 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 and this, I think, is, is, is I think the, the most impossible thing. And what I think we would hope for the future, we have said this and we, can, we will continue to repeat this, it's good if these agreements are taken as an example and if other countries might join and might go ahead in, in, uh, along the same way. Uh, again, uh, agreements uh, are good, uh, but agreements cannot be imposed because then the experience show that if you impose an agreement, maybe you can succeed in signing it, but it would be never implemented. So I think uh, that's what I, I would say to respond to your uh, different questions. Many thanks. Can, can I stay, stay with you for another few minutes, uh, again, realizing that you will have to leave early? Um, and that's a follow-up question and the obvious question. And, and uh, in some way, it's symptomatic for our conversation. We are not speaking primarily about the Palestinian-Israeli uh, peace talks. But if I turn to that situation and, and ask, um, how can we get the Palestinians uh, to join this peace train in, in the Middle East? What are the incentives that the European Union can give and perhaps together with the Americans so, so that the Palestinians are not the ones to lose out? And I'm, I'm sure that we, we both share this uh, concern. But as far as we are concerned, we, we, this is why also we want always to make clear that uh, our position is, is unchanged in the sense that we are for a two-state solution. Uh, we are for a solution uh, based on 67 lines and uh, Jerusalem as shared capital. I think this is, this is uh, what, we, what, we, what we think. Uh, now, we also think that the best way for the Palestinians to get uh, their legitimate aspirations is to engage. And this is also why we have been constantly uh, pushing them to engage and not to refuse uh, to engage. Uh, there are different ways you can do that. And we all know that uh, recently, for instance, uh, there were some, some, some positive developments on the issue of the tax revenues and on the issue of, let's say, technical uh, cooperation with, uh, with Israel. But uh, engaging with the other side is something you cannot escape. There are no shortcuts uh, for the reasons I said before. Our aim is an agreement. And therefore, uh, you, 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 you need to negotiate an agreement. Uh, if you want a Palestinian state, you need to act uh, as state uh, do and sit at the table and talk and, and defend your interest and, and, and push for your legitimate aspirations. So I think that would be the best way to, to, to go ahead. Uh, direct negotiations between the two sides uh, based on uh, international parameters and uh, hopefully with the international community which can regroup and accompany uh, this uh, this uh, this process i think that would be the best the best guarantee and when i when i speak in terms of international community regrouping uh, of course quartet is always something i have in mind as a, as a as a format where the european union the us and the un and the russians uh, cooperate together thank you Thank, thank you. And, um, and I think this is, again, a, a good uh, time to come over to you, Ambassador Lishnoyar, and you've heard uh, the comments from the European Exter External Action Service. What, what are your reflections? And um, I, I, I realized that Gentilini is a, is a good diplomat. He did not, he did not dare to uh, <laughs> be on the record of having graded the, the U.S. administration. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, Ambassador Leshnoyar, if you, 
if you are more courageous and brave, or if you want to be diplomatic now in these times of transitions, but the floor is yours. Thank you, Thomas. I'm not as, uh, as experienced uh, as Ambassador Gentilini, uh, but I will say the following. Uh, as Israel, uh, traditionally, uh, we enjoy excellent uh, relationships with uh, all administrations uh, in Washington, D.C., and also with Congress. And uh, uh, traditionally, uh, we uh, enjoy bipartisan support on issues uh, important for Israel's national security, and we appreciate that. Uh, we know President-elect Biden uh, uh, well. His uh, voting record in, uh, in Senate on Israel-related issues is perfect. He has been numerous times in, uh, in visiting Israel. Uh, he and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu are personal acquaintances. They know each other for many, many uh, years. Uh, so we trust that uh, the very good relationship between our two countries will continue under the Biden administration. Not only because they like Israel, not only because of the um, uh, common heritage, not only, uh, only because we both nations believe in the Bible, and not only because of the pioneer, pioneer, pioneering, pioneering spirit uh, of the state of Israel that Americans admire because of their uh, pioneering uh, 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 heritage, uh, but also because uh, of uh, uh, because Israel uh, is uh, uh, serving American uh, interests uh, in the region as well as the United States is uh, sensitive and helpful to Israeli uh, interest on so many uh, issues. So the alliance between Israel and the US is not uh, related to this or that prime minister in Jerusalem or this or that president in, uh, in Washington, but is well enshrined uh, uh, in many years of uh, 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 friendship and uh, uh, alliance, and it would continue also uh, under the new administration in, uh, in uh, Washington, uh, uh, D.C. At the end, I think that what we all need, Israelis, Europeans, Arabs, and others, is a strong America, America that is leading uh, the group of uh, democratic nations, America that is at the top of world economy, world science, world innovation, uh, uh, and we look forward to uh, uh, working with uh, the new administration on all those uh, 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 issues. We know many of the uh, uh, new members of the Biden uh, uh, team from uh, 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 previous administrations. They know us uh, 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 excellent uh, uh, as well. They will find a different Middle East, I think it's also a different Europe, a different world that they will have to, uh, uh, to learn and understand and find solutions for the many problems that, uh, that uh, we have. But I think that if the United States, Europe and Israel will work together, then there is no problem that we cannot solve together. Thank you. Thank you. And um, again, over to, to Vienna. And um, I think I, I hinted at, at the trend that um, the uh, current US administration already was uh, showing signs of withdrawal from the Middle East. And um, from what we understand, or from what, what I, the little I understand, is that the Biden administration, uh, if, if it is Biden who will get the electorate on the 14th of December, that um, he has also expressed uh, uh, less of a priority um, for the Middle East. Um, is, is this a correct observation? Is this something we should be concerned about? Um, and um, again, please, feel free to, to look back at the, the Trump presidency and, and this transition. But keep in mind this question, more, more broader question, is it so that the United States is, 
is withdrawing from, from the Middle East and uh, reprioritizing geopolitically its interest around the world and should we be concerned? Um, if I had to say yes or no, I would say no. Uh, no reason to be concerned. Uh, why, why do we say that, that clear? Because it's not black or white, it's maybe something in between. But generally, I would say already 10 or more years ago, let's say a focus of the United States went to Asia. Uh, not away from the Middle East, uh, but away from Europe. And that's something we have to deal with. That's a different story. Uh, but uh, also connected to that, what the ambassador has said before. Uh, I guess there is this huge bipartisan commitment in the United States regarding the Middle East and regarding Israel. And this is important. And this is also, I'm very clear on that and frank. This is an example for Europe because America is so far away. And anyway, they are committed so much to Israel. We are so close, we are much more affected by everything that happens in the Middle East to Israel in a positive way when it comes to the before mentioned things like economy and so on. Uh, also in a negative way when it comes to terrorist threats and security threats of different kinds. We are so close, uh, but uh, uh, anyway, nevertheless, we, we are not that much committed as the US shows with this bipartisan approach. Of course, uh, when I can be frank as a parliamentarian in Europe who really, uh, who really admires uh, the United States of America, um, I was a little shocked a few years ago when I recognized uh, that there is a so-called progressive movement within the Democratic Party, uh, which uh, would uh, conduct a different approach to Israel and to the Middle East. Uh, but as far as we can see, it's true what the ambassador has said, of course, uh, it's true, uh, Joe Biden has done a great job in his parliamentary work regarding the Middle East uh, in the Senate. Uh, he has done a good job as a vice president regarding Israel and the Middle East. He's clearly a moderate Democrat, uh, a part of this uh, traditional great, wonderful uh, party as one of these two parties uh, who serve uh, the United States of America. So uh, that's why uh, I guess the bipartisan approach will remain uh, and the focus on the Middle East will remain because it must remain because of the momentum you have already mentioned. Uh, it would be a, a major mistake uh, to, to lose this momentum now. Uh, this would be wrong and I'm absolutely sure that each and every reasonable person in both parties in the United States know it and uh, that also uh, the, the newly elected administration does know it. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mandel, again. And, and I realize that we will be uh, losing um, Mr. Gentilini in a, in a few. Do, do you have any, any closing, closing words? You, you get the chance now um, before, you, before you go. And uh, this way, we won't be able to oppose you either. No, no, I, I simply want to thank you all. Uh, it was uh, was a pleasure, and uh, and I, I I enjoyed being part of this uh, webinar. I wish you all uh, the best, uh, and I hope next time we will have a, a real uh, interaction uh, meeting in person uh, somewhere. The sooner the better. Many thanks. Thanks to all. Th thank you, Mr. Gentilini. And, and before you go, we, um, we, we heard just before you came on the, on the webinar that you've been um, positive, uh, COVID positive for some time, and now you're negative. So we are very happy about your negativity. And, uh, but we hope when it comes to the prospects for the Middle East that we can be positive. And we're looking forward to work with you in, in days to come. So all the best and, and keep safe. We, we will stay on for another five, uh, 10 minutes. And I, I actually would like to come back to you, um, Lucas Mandel. You, you mentioned, and I think it's a uh, it's, um, correct observation to say that why is it that we have this bipartisan um, uh, support for Israel in the United States, whereas uh, Europe should be the natural ally and, and I think it's a million dollar question that we've all been thinking about. Um, have you, and I'm sure you have had reason to re reflect on this as well. 
Actually, yes. Um, uh, first of all, for example, our Transatlantic Friends of Israel group is, as mentioned, uh, multipartisan, and uh, in our group are members of all, I would call it, reasonable groups of European Parliament. Uh, as we all know, only the, the very far right and the very far left uh, don't have anybody who uh, is interested uh, or is at least open for arguments uh, in that field. So uh, in that case, one can claim a multi-partisan approach at least. It's not yet a commitment. Uh, as we all know, it's also not yet a commitment between the member states, uh, which also play a crucial role uh, in uh, the European Union, as we all know, we as the European Parliament representing the people, the Council representing the 27 uh, member states, uh, sometimes have different approaches. And we know, for example, in the field of terrorism, in the field of uh, uh, condemning Hezbollah uh, and uh, other fields, uh, we don't have uh, uh, a real agreement among all member states. We have different uh, positions there and we have to work on that issue each and every day to achieve a different approach and uh, also to to connect people uh, and I want I want also you mentioned positivity I want to share with you a positive sign at least in Austria in my home country but also in other parts of Europe uh, especially uh, Israeli diplomacy uh, but also I would say Israeli civil society and economy have done a great job uh, for many many years now in connecting people in uh, bringing young people together, in uh, creating partnerships, twinning projects, and so on, in order to make people aware of what's really happening, of what's really happening. If, if, if uh, people, uh, let's say, lose out Israel of sight uh, and the true situation that civilians are threatened from the outside, nearly from each and every border of their small country, uh, uh, which is at the same time the only country conducting our way of life, a Western approach, a liberal, democratic, uh, civilized hmm, approach, uh, fighting terrorism on a daily basis. We had a terrorist attack two weeks ago, unfortunately, or three weeks ago in Vienna, and uh, we are still shocked. Uh, and uh, yeah, talking to Israel friends and Jewish friends, I, I again understood uh, that's uh, something that can happen each and every day because it happens several times a year, a month, maybe a week uh, in Israel. So Israel is uh, uh, well aware of how to fight terrorism and other fields where we have to work together as civilized uh, societies. Uh, and that's why there are many good reasons to work in the right direction. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen as Commission's president has claimed her commission would be the very first geopolitical commission that's something I like about her and her approach, uh, because that must mean uh, that Europe uh, gets more engaged and uh, in, a, in a more clear way uh, engaged uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, that the Commission of Ahili, after many commissioners who missed that, uh, announced a new association agreement and a new association council is also a good sign, but we have to work on that on a daily basis. And frankly, uh, even if I have mentioned uh, the last years where huge achievements and even while i disagree with a lot of things of the trump administration i i really totally or nearly totally agree uh, maybe 95 percent with the middle east policy of the trump administration uh, but there's one positive thing generally that the transatlantic partnership can become easier uh, uh, during the biden administration and that can also have positive effects for both EU, US, uh, our Middle East uh, policies and uh, the connection Israel, EU and US. Thank, thank you again, uh, Lucas Mandel. And, and um, in, in this uh, time in the program, we'll get to the closing remarks. And, uh, but before doing that, uh, I, I don't want to forget to express our uh, well, first condolences for the terrorist attack, but also our our support for the uh, for the chancellor, and I think he is exceptional in a European context as both the uh, uh, the leader who is uh, giving leadership in fighting anti-Semitism, but also in being uh, a very open and strong and vocal supporter of Israel. So. I, I hope um, you're in Vienna now. So when you see the chancellor next time, please 
convey our, our gratitudes. Um, let us have a closing round, and I'm, I'm coming back to you now, Ambassador Leshnoyar, um, for some, some closing um, uh, final remarks. You may want to, um, uh, what I was thinking of was, was more to say, well, listen, we have a new situation, it's a new cycle. What are the areas where United States and Europe needs to become stronger and, and better in, in coordinating their efforts and working together in support for Israel? Please. Yes. Um, well, I think that uh, first and foremost, they have to be uh, uh, sensitive to Israel's uh, uh, security challenges, the way that Israel defines them. And that's an important element in what I want to share with you. Israel will define itself what are its security challenges. No external power, be it America, Europe, or anyone else, will define it for us. And, uh, and that's the beginning of disagreement between us and, uh, and some uh, external uh, powers. And I don't mean by that the Americans. Uh, so first, to be more sensitive to, to uh, what Israel has to say about its uh, security. It's not, it's not a slogan. And when people say that they are committed to Israel's security, I am not always sure that they mean what they say, or they mean it in a way that is not reassuring for Israelis. Uh, uh, and to translate it into, into practicalities, the courting of Iran is not a way to reassure Israel that you really understand our security concerns. Okay, now, uh, so the number one challenge that we have in the region, and I would like the Americans and the Europeans and others to pay good attention to, is what Iran is doing in the region, uh, which is practically undermining the security of the Middle East, uh, 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 attacking in different ways uh, the moderate governments and regimes in the region, uh, and directly and indirectly harming European and American interests. So this is one thing that I will emphasize. The second thing is radicalism. And radicalism in the Middle East comes in different ways and shapes, in addition to what we have in Iran. So first, the proxies of Iran, be it uh, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, but not only in Lebanon. So I commend those member states of the European Union, that, uh, including Austria, that uh, uh, recognize uh, Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, not only uh, the military, so-called military wing of, uh, of Hezbollah, and we would call on all member states to do the same, to recognize and announce Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, full stop, without any distinction between this or that uh, uh, wing. Hezbollah is also active in Europe. Hezbollah is active in Syria. Hezbollah is active in the Gulf. Uh, and uh, in general, helping Iran to undermine uh, security in the region and taking as a hostage a, a Middle East country, namely Lebanon, which is a good friend of Europe and important for Europe, but still controlled by a terrorist organization. And there are other Iranian proxies active in the region, uh, in Iraq, in Syria, uh, in, 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 in Yemen, even in North uh, uh, Africa. Uh, 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 and, and, and this uh, radicalism and the Iran challenge is what brings one of the reasons why Israel is now much closer or why Arab countries are now much closer to uh, Israel and see Israel as an uh, uh, ally. Uh, and then there is a serious democracy deficit in the Middle East still. Uh, and as long as we don't see any uh, a progress uh, in this regard, the Middle East will continue to be a hotspot uh, for Americans, for Europeans, for uh, 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 
uh, Israelis. And uh, earlier, uh, you, I think, asked uh, if the administration will be more focused on the Middle East. I think that the answer should be put a little differently. Will the Middle East focus on the administration? Because it's not up to Washington <laughs> to decide always if they want or don't want to be more engaged in the Middle East. Sometimes simply the Middle East comes to them and force them, forces them to be more involved in the, in the uh, 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 middle, uh, middle East. And lastly, and I have much more to say, but the time is short, I will say that unfortunately, Europe is absent in the Middle East. Uh, when you look around at the um, crisis, different crises in the Middle East and even beyond the boundaries of the Middle East, you look at uh, Syria, you look at Yemen, you look at Libya, you look at Lebanon, you look at Nagorno-Karabakh, if you like, you look at Ethiopia, the EU is not there, it's not there, but they want to be players in a game that they are not, they don't even know the rules of that, uh, of that game. That's very unfortunate. That's very unfortunate uh, because we need what Europe knows to bring with it to the, uh, uh, to the table. But at the moment, there is a vacuum. Uh, hopefully the new administration in Washington will be more interested in filling that uh, vacuum because we don't want other less friendly forces to fill that uh, uh, vacuum. And in that regard, and I will finish with that, I will repeat what I said earlier. The US, Europe, and Israel must work together to bring more stability, more peace, and more prosperity to the Middle East. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you again, Ambassador Lesh Nayar. And um, before I close officially, I will give the, the last uh, concluding remarks to, to Member of European Parliament, Lucas Manda. Thank you, it's just... Uh want to express uh, that I agree with the ambassador. Europe is uh, not present. Uh, it is not present enough and sometimes present in the wrong way. Uh, in the region, uh, friends and me among our transatlantic friends of Israel group and European parliament are strongly fighting against the wrong allocation of European taxpayers' money to people or institutions that are connected, directly or indirectly, it doesn't matter actually doesn't matter, as well as it doesn't matter whether one arm or this arm is, is a terrorist arm, it's a terrorist organization, and if money is, is uh, uh, redirected to, to entities or persons uh, connected to terrorism, uh, it's, uh, it's a shame. It's a shame for Europe. And that's something we, we strongly fight. Uh, and that's, this is in the framework of something, Europe is on a global scale relatively good, called soft power, but uh, allocating money to the wrong persons is, is the wrong soft power. And Europe has to gain much more, as we call it, hard power. Uh, and uh, also the commission's uh, president knows it. And the commission's president has clearly stated in her mission letter for uh, the foreign affairs commissioner, the high representative, that he has to work on a defense uh, union. We are for the first time creating a European Defense Fund uh, for the first time in history. There is in a European budget, a specific European Defense Fund uh, from January 1st on, uh, but we have to fill everything of this with, with sense and with life and with uh, substantial activities. And uh, this, this is about to come hopefully, but yet we are not uh, present enough. And that's, uh, that's really a shame and it's a uh, homework. We have to fulfill a huge priority and a huge obligation uh, regarding the Middle East and maybe very last sentence, let's also always talk to our children and to each and everybody uh, about friendship and the positive aspects uh, within the, the broad, broad Western world and all its opportunities for individuals, for communities, for civilization, for creativity, for culture and so on. Uh, we are defending uh, ourselves. Uh, we know the security threats. We know the troubles and problems we have to solve, but let's also talk about opportunities and positive uh, perspectives uh, that motivates us, at least me. It motivates me to, uh, to do uh, this work and I'm more than happy uh, having the opportunity to, to do that. Uh, and I again, thank you for having the opportunity to being part of this panel today. 
Thank you, Mr. Mandel, and thank you, uh, Ambassador Leshnoyar. Uh, this will conclude our webinar today, and only to say that uh, on the 14th of December, which is a Monday, we will have our second part of the annual conference, which will focus on the, the combat against anti-Semitism and look at the Jewish communities um, in Europe during this um, uh, the year of the pandemic and how the COVID-19 has affected Jewish community life in, in Europe. We will be joined by Katarina von Schnobein, by Chief Rabbi Pinchas Goldsmith from Moscow, and by uh, a colleague of yours, uh, and I understand a good friend, Nicola Baer from, from Germany, to speak on these topics. But um, again, thank you so much for everything you do in Brussels, and we are hoping that we can meet uh, sooner rather uh, than later, not on Zoom, and um, hopefully even without a face mask. So with these words, uh, thank you to everyone, also to the viewers, and uh, all the best to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.